Thank you very much. Really uh, appreciative to be here and for the opportunity to talk. And also special thanks to the team at Viz for the invitation as well. So um, as you said, we're, we're going to get in and dive into the kind of changing landscape here of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, in athletes and specifically how we kind of risk stratify this group and talk about shared decision making in them as well. So excited to dive into this and, and talk about some of the nuances here. Um, th these are the teams and the organizations uh, which I provide coverage to, but really no other disclosures that are relevant to this talk. So here are my objectives for today. I definitely want to discuss the evolution of exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and specifically the guidelines, how they've changed. There's going to be a talk upcoming, I know, within the series uh, regarding specifically this, this evolution, but I think it's important to talk about how we got to where we are today. Um, certainly risk stratification is really important in this group when it comes to sport participation. So I want to review how we do that in our practice and how we think it's appropriate to do so. We'll talk about shared decision making, which is definitely a buzzword these days and something you hear more and more about. And we'll show you how we do it in our practice. And then you can't talk about any of this without talking about emergency action plans or certainly I cannot. So I'll briefly touch on that at the end as well. So just for purposes of review, what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for those who may not be as familiar with the condition or don't see it as often as others? It is um, abnormal left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of the heart muscle in absence of another clear etiology. Uh, one of those clear etiologies can be hypertension, but certainly there are many others that can do it. Uh, there's physiologic remodeling, there are infiltrative heart disease. So lot, lots of things that can have that ventricle become thick. Um, but this is one that, that we're going to focus on today, obviously. It, it is quite prevalent, so about 1 in 500 in the population. If you look at some genetic data, it may be even as high as two, 1 in 250. But it, in our world, we normally think about it as terms of 1 in 500, and it is far and away the most common genetic cardiomyopathy, the most inherited cardiomyopathy that there is. There are different variations, different phenotypic expressions of this. Just to cover it briefly, there is the sigmoid septum variant, where just that isolated sigmoid hypertrophy is noted with an ovoid LV, LV cavity. There is the reverse septal or reverse curve contour of the left ventricle, where you really have a mid-septal prominence, prominence towards the left ventricular cavity, creating more of a crescent-shaped LV. There is the apical variant, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you have progressive thickening of the left ventricle towards the apex. And then there's kind of this neutral variant as well, where you, you have variable penetrance of the, the left ventricular hypertrophy, and it can create any different um, type of LV morphology as well. What's important to note is that varying on that hypertrophy can be obstructive or non-obstructive physiology, and that becomes very important as we talk about it in terms of athletes. So when we think of non-obstructive physiology, certainly the left ventricle is hypertroph hypertrophied, as you see on the left here of the screen. Um, the, the ventricular cavity is small, but as the ventricle contracts, that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is not pulled into the left ventricular outflow tract, does not cause obstruction of blood flow leaving the left ventricular cavity. Um, and those symptoms may still exist. Those symptoms are not due to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This is an important distinction to make as you look at the right of your screen where you do have obstructive physiology that because of that thickening of the left ventricle, um, there is increased velocities of blood flow that pull the that pull the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve into the left ventricular outflow tract. This is that systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve or SAM that we hear about also frequently, and it causes obstruction of blood flow out of the cavity and into the aorta. This is obstructive physiology. And, and so when we think about our athletes or we think about exercise in general in this population, it really is important to know and, and have a baseline understanding of, our, of the patients of are they obstructive or non-obstructive physiology. And we'll review some cases of how we get into that in, in a moment. So as we think about exercise in this population, um, specifically as it pertains to competitive or highly uh, vigorous sport, um, many of us who do this go to what's called the Bethesda guidelines, which uh, the first iteration of such was in 1985. And you see that in front of you here on the screen now. It, essentially, these criteria, the Bethesda guidelines, look at any type of cardiovascular pathology that's relevant to sport participation and try, based on the evidence available, as well as expert consensus opinion, um, to risk stratify those conditions and give recommendations as to what is appropriate or not in terms of sport. So if we dive into the first iteration of this, which is in 1985, and there's been four, I will show you the most recent here in just a second. But in 1985, the first iteration looked at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And on the right, it, it tells you that 
um, anybody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cannot participate in competitive sports, specifically those with left ventricular hypertrophy of more than 20 millimeters, if there's outflow tract obstruction. Um, and certainly if there are ventricular atrial arrhythmias, they did not want athletes participating in sport. It was saying that some sports may be uh, okay to engage in, that those without any of the findings or the symptoms listed above, but that generally they, they really should not be participating in sport. And that's even true for those who had maybe been treated with a surgical myectomy at the time. And if you look below, these recommendations were based largely on published data, but also kind of a common sense or just trust your gut kind of approach that we didn't have a lot of data at that time, but just based on the fact that this could be a, a disease associated, that this is a disease associated with sudden cardiac arrest that we felt at that point in time that maybe it wasn't so great that these people participated in vigorous sport. Flash forward to the most recent guidelines. Again, there's been four of these, but here's 2015, which was the most recent update. Um, things haven't changed very much. And, and now it says very specifically that those with probable or unequivocal clinical expression of HEM should not participate in most competitive sports, except those that are low intensity from a dynamic or aerobic and a static or an isometric form of exercise. And so if uh, you, you look at what those exercises are, that's curling, golf, billiards, riflery, those are the sports that, that this criteria and this consensus guidelines thinks is okay for those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if you are seeing an athlete in your clinic and you're trying to decide what to do and you you consult these guidelines and, and you're looking for the most recent update, this again is eight years ago, this is what you'll find and this is what you're told um, you should be doing. But you know things change and, and we get more data and, and we evolve with the times and, and those who do a lot of HCM began to look at this and wonder, well, what's actually going on? What's happening in the real world? And, and are people being active are they participating? Are they doing it safely with HCM? What does the data actually tell us here? So th this is a study done just to kind of sample the population. The, the, the study says very nicely and eloquently that before we can even begin to understand the safety, we actually need to know what's happening on the ground right now. And so this looked at a survey of those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus controls. And it looked at them in terms of work-related activities, both vigorous and moderate, as well as recreational activities, both vigorous and moder moderate. And across the board, what was found that those, those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy really were much less active, both in a work setting and in a recreational setting than those who do not. So um, mainly people were adhering to these guidelines, that they were not engaging in vigorous work or exercise activity, um, and the behaviors were such based on the guidelines. But people began to think about this and, and saying, well, okay, this is what's happening. Should we restrict these people or should we begin to rethink about it? And I, I really like this graph because I think it, it kind of summarizes nicely some of the controver controversies and um, things that we go through in our minds when we're seeing those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thinking of it from a psychological effect and a physiological effect on the left side of your screen being the negative. So from a physiological aspect, why do we worry about exercise in this group? Well, because the exercise causes increased chronotropy and inotropy that can increase the gradient over the LVOT. We've all seen this with our stress echoes. It can impair myocardial blood flow. You've got these big thick ventricles and it can create a supply demand process through microvascular limitations. And it can also cause ventricular and atrial arrhythmias. We've seen these in our patients who we exercise. From a psychological standpoint, there's anxiety due to fear of these arrhythmias from the family, individual coaches, team members. And I would even add to this, the physicians and, and those who treat these patients from the healthcare team. We, we all live with this fear in, in the back of our minds of could something happen? So th this is a very nice graph to talk about the negative effects uh, that could potentially be there from HCM. However, if you look at the positive effects of exercise here from a physiological standpoint, VO2 max can improve. And we know that VO2 max is the single best predictor of health outcomes. And perhaps there may be, although I think this is still a little bit premature at this point in time, potential for some um, reverse LV remodeling, but certainly some metabolic improvements as well from a physiological standpoint of positive in the HCM community. Um, and certainly we know that exercise is the best mental health medicine that there is. And the more we get people exercising, the better off they are, and, and including um, community and social engagements that come with that. So um, this really looks at the balance very nicely of the negative and, and positive, both perceived and known effects of exercise. Um, 
But then we begin to look at it from more of a, a case control um, process, trying to exercise patients with HCM to see, number one, how do they do? And number two, is it actually safe? So it, this was a study led by Charlene Day and Sarah Saberi, and they exercised patients with HCM over 16 weeks. And at the end of those 16 weeks, what they found was that those who engaged in the exercise program with HCM had improved VO2 max compared to those who did not exercise. And in fact, it was safe to do so, that there were not increased events, be it syncope or arrhythmias, in the patients who exercised with HCM versus those who engaged in their usual activities. So this is really good data and some of the first that comes out that tells us it is in fact safe and beneficial for those with HCM to exercise. So here's a case, this is one of our patients that can help to illustrate that. This was a 46 year old male who had a history of hypertension. He came to the hospital with worsening chest heaviness that was exertional in nature. And truly this had been going on for years. It had been worsening recently. He had seen a cardiologist within the past several, mo several months was told his heart was quote unquote enlarged, but there was nothing further to do. He had no family history. And frankly, because of these symptoms, he had not been exercising for many months due to the symptoms to the point that he was no longer able to play with his children because of those symptoms. So here's his electrocardiogram. And if you look at this and you, you see patients in this population frequently, um, you note the significant T wave inversions uh, throughout, and you begin to think, uh, is this an underlying cardiomyopathy or not? So here's his echocardiogram that was done with us. Certainly uh, there's some degree of left ventricular hypertrophy in the parasternal long axis view, but you're getting the sense here in the, in the actual image on the left that's moving that there could be something going on at the apex. So we move into the apical four chamber and you begin to see the classic findings of apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, significant and progressive um, left ventricular hypertrophy towards the apex in that classic spade pattern that we're used to seeing here. This was at rest, and you get the sense that there could be some degree of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve here. There's flow acceleration in the LVOT on the video, and our sonographers really go looking for this, and I'll show that to you in a minute, but th there's really no significant gradient here that we were able to provoke both with Valsalva and at rest. Certainly his uh, strain is abnormal, and you can see significant abnormalities towards the apex of his strain with an average of negative 13.8%. Here's his cardiac MRI. Once again, you can see classic findings for apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, significant and progressive thickening towards the apex. So we did a stress echo on him, again, trying to provoke the gradient and actually see what was going on as he exercised, given his exercise intolerance. And, and we were not able to, to uh, have any gradient whatsoever. Yes, this is apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but his symptoms were so significant that we had to wonder whether or not this was obstruction. And, and not only were we not able to provoke a gradient, but he went 11 minutes on a Bruce protocol with us. He had no arrhythmias whatsoever. It was a completely normal blood pressure response. His Holter had no ventricular arrhythmias in terms of the rest of his risk stratification. His MRI did have some patchy enhancement at the apex. There were no aneurysms and no other findings that were unusual in him. So what we did with him was sit down. We had a long discussion with him and said, really, there was no high risk features. Yes, he was symptomatic and we could deal with that by giving him a beta blocker, which we did, but we gave him an exercise prescription. I, ideally, I would have done a cardiopulmonary exercise test at this time. Uh, unfortunately, my CPEP was down and we just needed some data to get him moving. So we did give him an exercise prescription um, and follow up appointments. He's now playing with his children. He's playing uh, recreational uh, sports with friends and he's doing much better. So exercise for him was beneficial and something that we prescribed. Again, I, I don't want to hammer that home too much because we'll, there'll be another talk coming on this, but it helps to illustrate this evolution. And, and if you follow the guidelines, these came out in 2020, really wonderful HCM guidelines that I encourage everyone to read. They're, they're very uh, easy to move through. Now our guidelines are completely different than what we were seeing in the Bethesda criteria that without qualification whatsoever, we are now saying that for most patients with HCM, mild to moderate intensity recreational exercise is not only encouraged, but it's beneficial to improve cardiorespiratory fitness, physical functioning, quality of life, et cetera. And, and we certainly saw that with that patient we did before. So there's been a real paradigm shift here. Not only with that though, we have seen a paradigm shift in the world of sports cardiology as it relates to those who are competing and playing with cardiac pathology that could be relevant to sport. And, and no more true is that than in the world of HCM. In those same guidelines, the, the guidelines suggest that those with HCM, mild to moderate recreational activity is beneficial like we talked about, that athletes with HCM, a comprehensive evaluation is required prior to returning to sport, that for most patients with HCM, um, that 
that uh, those who are, pardon me, those with HCM who are genotype positive but phenotype negative, certainly they can participate. But with those who want to compete in high intensity activity or even competitive activity, that a comprehensive evaluation with shared decision making is encouraged while conveying the risks, both known and unknown. So for the first time, we're really seeing that this may be possible, but that it can be done um, safely in, in those in, in expert hands. And most recently, we've had a study come out. This was uh, presented at ACC uh, this year by Dr. Rachel Lampert. This was the Live HCM study, which looked at over 1,500 patients across the world who have HCM and who were competing either in vigorous, who were uh, participating in vigorous exercise, moderate exercise, or no exercise whatsoever. And at the end of that that follow up study, we found that there was no increase in events in those who were participating in vigorous activity versus those who were not. So very powerful data, um, which has helped to provide us with a backbone that as we continue to risk stratify these patients and maybe get them back into sport, that we can perhaps do so safely, again, in hands of those who are comfortable dealing with those in the population. And so studies like this, and the, the consensus has been that no longer are we in a, a place in the world of sports cardiology where we are testing to disqualify those, but we're actually looking to identify those with cardiac pathology and, and, and treat them, diagnose them, and move forward if needed. So the, the traditional method of how those of us who engage with athletes often was um, that you would have the pre-participation exam, PPE, there would be a cardiac screen involved. Oftentimes that's an electrocardiogram or an echocardiogram, depending on what level of sport you are at. If it was a negative screen, meaning the ECG was normal, the exam was normal, and nothing worrisome on history, that that athlete would be cleared and could then go participate in sport. However, if the screen was positive from any standpoint whatsoever and a diagnosis was confirmed, no matter what, that athlete was disqualified. He or she was told, thanks for trying. Unfortunately, it's not going to work. Good luck to you. And, and they were sent on their way with really no significant um, data to back that up and, and no plan of how perhaps they get back or how they can continue to exercise and be active in a safe way. But because of things like live HCM and, and more and more volume of athletes competing with heart disease, we've moved into a different era in the world of sports cardiology, where I would say it's a contemporary era, where now our screen takes place, um, again, with an ECG, with an echo, if depending on where you are and where you're doing it. And if that screen is positive, that it's important to diagnose it, make sure that the accuracy is there, treat that condition if it's required to do so, and then really engage in a risk stratification. And, and I think that risk stratification is best if done in the hands of those who are really comfortable with that condition and its overlap in sport. That could be HCM, long QT syndrome, valvular heart disease, whatever it may be, but the understanding of the physiology and how it relates to the sport that the athlete participates in becomes really important. Again, I'll give you examples of this momentarily. And then once that risk stratification is done, really sitting down and having a shared decision-making conversation on what it means to return to play. And, and I'll dive into shared decision-making here. So you can see the differences here that no longer is it as simple as test to either find something or not and move forward, but it's a really engaged process where the sports cardiologist has become an active member of the, the athletic healthcare team to help keep our athletes safe. So th this has been a, a significant paradigm shift within the world of sports cardiology. And, and this is what we're doing as we engage these athletes. Number one, on the, on the left, we're, we're trying to figure out what is this actual risk of, of continuing to continuing to play? Is there a sudden cardiac arrest risk that's real that, that occurs with the condition if it is or is not treated? Can we worsen the condition by continuing to participate at a high level? Are there resources available locally to deal with an acute event should that um, pathology flare during or around the sport participation? And then what's the liability of the organization? There are certain organizations which may say this is just not a liability we're willing to accept. I'm sorry, but we, we can't deal with it. Versus what is actually the disqualify? What is the risk of actually disqualifying these athletes? Is the sudden cardiac arrest risk really that high? Is it something that we really need to be concerned about or is it actually lower than what we think? What's the risk of metabolic derangements by disqualifying the athlete? We know that with lack of exercise, blood pressure can go up, weight can go up, VO2 max can go down, blood sugars can go up. Um, so there's significant metabolic consequences to not having someone exercise any longer. There's significant mental health benefits to having those not exercise any longer. Again, exercise is the best mental health medication I have. So we want to continue to get people to do this, not look for reasons not to. 
what do people do in their extracurricular time? So if you take a college athlete and tell them that he or she cannot play any longer, what are they going to fill that time with? Are they going to spend more time um, doing things that they would not have done otherwise that may be detrimental to their health had they been in the weight room, in the film room, um, in the cheering squad, um, had they been able to continue to play? And then not inc inconsequential by any means, what are the risks to future income at, at the really highest level of sport if you're disqualifying an athlete? So these are all things that go into this constant balance that we undertake when we are risk stratifying our athletes. So let me give you some examples of what this looks like in athletes that we've had in our clinic to, to help illustrate how we do this. So um, first is a 24-year-old male college basketball player who was self-referred. Um, this was during the era of COVID. He was told he had athlete's heart after getting his risk stratification after his viral illness. Uh, if you remember back then, we were doing ECGs and echoes on every athlete who had COVID at that point in time. The athlete was told his ECG was quote unquote funny and that he should tell all of those that he has an ECG with in the future that it was funny, but he was told he was totally fine to play and there was nothing further to do at this point in time. Well, that didn't make he and his family very very comfortable. Um, so they decided to get second opinion and, and came to us for further evaluation. So this was his electrocardiogram. Uh, again, for those who see a lot of patients with HCM or those with cardiomyopathies, this ECG um, is not only funny, but it is uh, some type of cardiomyopathy until proven otherwise. So as we do with everybody, we get an echo straight away in this setting. And here he is in the parasternal long axis. You can see really no significant left ventricular hypertrophy whatsoever. The ventricle is of normal size. The aorta looks good. But as we move into our apical four chamber, once again, we begin to see features consistent with apical variant HCM. His strain is not normal. His GLS is down at negative 12.9%. Certainly at the apex, it, it does not look normal. But again, this begins to look like apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's his cardiac MRI, not as profound as the first patient I showed you, but you can classically see the spade-like formation at the apex of the left ventricle, progressive thickening of the left ventricle towards the apex. Again, this is apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. To help prove the point uh, with late gadolinium enhancement, you see patchy uh, mid-wall delayed enhancement of the inferior wall at the apex and mid-apex as well. Um, helps to further the diagnosis if we had any questions. Here's more views showing you the same. Um, and once again, we did a stress echocardiogram on him. Just want to be sure that there is no significant left ventricular alpha tract gradient, although I think we were pretty comfortable with that from the beginning. This was an asymptomatic young man. I, as I told you before, we did a Bruce on the initial patient, but on this one, because he is a basketball player, um, we don't do the Bruce protocol. It's not very helpful. We have uh, varying protocols that we use depending on what the athlete is. So this was a manual protocol. He achieved 16 METs. He got a heart rate of 197 beats per minute, a normal blood pressure response, no arrhythmias whatsoever. And when we exercise these patients, we are doing so to the point where they are telling us to stop it. This is not a stress test where you achieve 85%, say, thank you very much, get off, please go lie on the bed and let's get our pictures. We are pushing these athletes to their absolute maximum where they are huffing and puffing, cannot talk, need to grab the, the handlebars of the treadmill or stop even riding the bike because they've pushed so hard, because that is how we can get the best risk stratification for what happens for this athlete's point of view on a basketball court if he's running up on a fast break, needing to get the game winning shot with the game on the line. So the, it, it is really, really important to stress these athletes as maximally as possible. So to summarize him, he was asymptomatic with apical variant HCM and a basketball player. His testing was very low risk with minimal LGE. We do Holter monitors on all these folks, and he had a completely normal Holter with no ventricular activity whatsoever. So we sat down with the athlete and his family, discussed the diagnosis. We discussed that his risk was higher than someone without HCM, but much lower given the apical variant and all of his reassuring testing. He elected to continue to play because he came to us on his own and was not referred by his school. We recommended that he reveal his diagnosis to the team in the school so that they could be aware. And we'll discuss why that's important in a moment. The athlete interestingly decided not to, but we strongly recommended that he did. Here's another case to contrast that against. Here's a 17-year-old elite high school American football player. He's an offensive lineman. He was recently diagnosed with HCM after an abnormal ECG. Again, completely asymptomatic, no family history. And he was sent to us by his cardiologist for risk stratification. Here's his initial electrocardiogram. And if you look at electrocardiograms in athletes frequently, this will be a familiar electrocardiogram to you, not because it's abnormal, but in fact, because it's actually completely normal. It's sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block, 
really no concerning findings on this electrocardiogram, but it was deemed abnormal by the team that was seeing him and, and he got further testing. So here's his testing with us. Um, you can see the, the peristernal long axis. There does appear to be some degree of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, though it's difficult to quantify as well as some flow acceleration through the LVOT. If we look at his measurements, he is certainly asymmetric in the septum, measuring about 16 millimeters or so in the septa wall versus uh, almost a centimeter in the posterior lateral wall. And then in cardiac MRI, which we get pretty much on all of our patients, he was measuring up to about 19 millimeters or so in the mid septum. Interestingly, he had a bicuspid aortic valve. The valve was opening quite normally without any regurgitation or stenosis, but it was an interesting finding in him nonetheless. Here's his apical four chamber, and you can see here we are trying to provoke gradients both at baseline and with Valsalva, and he had no provocable gradient at all, despite some suggestion of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Here's his cardiac MRI. I showed you the, the measurements before, but you can clearly see asymmetric septal hypertrophy here, possibly reverse curve variant. The, the lateral wall looks good, nice and thin, and he does have late gadolinium enhancement. It's present in the septum and it's less than 10% of the myocardium. Again, cannot stress the importance of MRI in this population enough, perhaps in all, definitely in all of our HCM patients, but especially in our athletes because SCAR is just so important to know and to quantify. So we're gonna stop there for just a second. And these are the questions we're kind of asking ourselves. Well, is this obstructive or non-obstructive HCM? At this point, can he continue his football career? And what else would you wanna know? Frankly, when he was sent to us, this is all the workup that had been done at that point in time. Nothing else had been done. And the question is, do we have enough here? Can we go? And um, the, the answer from our standpoint was no, that, that's not enough. We really need to see what happens when he exercises. I'm not convinced that there isn't a gradient there, and we need that data in order to properly risk stratify him. So he exercised. Again, we did a stress echo, pushed him to maximal intensity on a, a, a specific protocol that we have for our football players. And lo and behold, we uncovered gradients here, anywhere between 68 to 80 millimeters of mercury in the LVOT. So now we know that this is actually obstructive cardiomyopathy. So again, maximal effort stress echo. This is a big offensive lineman whose butt we were kicking on the treadmill to get the data we needed. We did have a provocable LVOT gradient. He had a Holter monitor with no arrhythmias. We sent genetic testing and he returned back with a variant of unknown significance. So now we know that this is obstructive HCM, but the question before us is, can he continue his football career because he has scholarship offers on the table and needs to know what to do? So once again, we sat with the athlete and his family. Um, we, we elected to continue to play and practice, but we wanted to start a beta blocker first. We started him on metoprolol succinate because of that gradient. And we really wanted to retest him again in a week to see how our medications were doing with the goal of hopefully getting his gradient to be less than 50 millimeters of mercury. Why 50? Because we know that that's associated, anything greater than 50 is associated with the risk of sudden cardiac arrest in this population. So here's his stress echo a week later on beta blocker, same protocol, same level of effort, same level of exercise. His heart rate response was blunted a little bit, um, but still nonetheless, he put in a good effort, same amount of functional capacity. And now his gradients had come down very nicely. He was now anywhere between 31 and 64, not perfect, but getting there. And we increased his beta blocker. So this really gets into the, the helm of athlete-specific risk stratification. And when athletes come to us and we are trying to understand what their risk is, we really need to know what their physiology is from a sports standpoint. And I'll show you the compare and contrast in a moment here, but this is kind of how the, these are the boxes that we fit them into. On one side, we have increasing static components of exercise. So as you go up the y-axis here, these at, at the top is, at the highest levels of static exercise are gymnasts, martial artists, rock climbing, sailing, really not of aerobic, not, not, not a lot of aerobic demands on the body, but a lot of isometric demand. So if you think of this, this is augmenting afterload, that these are exercises that increase blood pressure. And at the most significant, we are seeing dead deadlifters and, and power lifters getting 250 to 300 millimeters of mercury, if not more. Contrast that to those on the bottom who are increasing dynamic components of exercise. So on the far right of the x-axis, field hockey players, race walking, pure runners, then now we're augmenting cardiac output. Figure a resting cardiac output of six liters per minute that, that can double, triple, quadruple in this population. So you're really augmenting the cardiac output there, which if you think of this in the context of HCM, this is more desirable perhaps than the augmentation of afterload. But again, we will talk about how we think about that for our athletes. And then in the top right, it is different. Uh, it, now we're combining the two. These are our boxers, canoers, kayakers, cyclists. Now we're engaging all of these very large 
large muscle groups. We're engaging the most of cardiac output. So we're really putting the largest demands on the body. So let's contrast those two athletes in that setting with what we're thinking. If we think about our basketball athlete, if I go back, basketball kind of falls right in this category here. It is more, I'm sorry, basketball is in, in this category. It does have dynamic and static components, but um, more so than football in terms of augmenting both. So it is a highly dynamic sport. There's some static physiology. This is a gentleman who's playing indoors. It's temperature controlled. It's a low risk phenotype, phenotype with apical variant HCM. He had low risk testing and minimal LGE. For me, that's pretty easy. Um, this was an easy one to clear and, and really had minimal concerns with him that if we think about the risk of cardiac arrest in HCM, it's about one to one and a half percent in the population. I feel like his is much less than that. So it was a pretty easy clear after the discussion of the knowns and the unknowns there, um, though still the, the risk being there, not nearly as high as perhaps the American football athlete. Now we're talking about a much more static sport. And even within that, he plays a more static position. He's an offensive lineman. He's not a wide receiver, a cornerback, a running back who's doing a lot more dynamic. This is a guy who's over 300 pounds, who's having to push against other 300 pounders, who's really doing a lot of Valsalva maneuvers and pushing back. So position really matters. If this guy were a punter, I would think of him much differently than I do as him as an offensive lineman. If you throw even more to that, he's playing outdoors in some of the worst of South Florida weather. If you've been in South Florida during the months of August and September, I'm sure you were booking your flight to get out of here as quickly as possible. It's very hot. It's very humid. Um, a lot of the heat data we have seen come out has come from our state, and we have very aggressive um, heat mitigation measures in our athletes for these reasons. But in this specific athlete, I think of this much differently than I would the basketball player, much differently as an offensive lineman than I do a wide receiver or a punter. Yes, his gradient's improving, but he still has a degree of obstruction that the other athlete doesn't have. Yes, he has LG, it's minimal. So this is a much different conversation in terms of what's known versus unknown than the basketball athlete. And we really engage our families, our athletes in this to make sure we understand it before we return them to play. So hopefully that provides a nice uh, view of, of how we go through them. Just to show you one more, which I think is still relevant, this is a 29-year-old male who's extremely active, who was referred for an abnormal ECG, no family history. Here's his ECG. It looks very similar to the ECG we saw in our basketball player with apical HCM, diffuse T-wave inversions throughout, again, suggestive of ap apical HCM until proven otherwise. Here's his transthoracic echocardiogram, uh, maybe a little bit of left ventricular hypertrophy, though certainly concentric in nature, no evidence of asymmetry at all. Here's his apical four chamber, not perfect images, but it looks okay to me. Uh, it does leave me a question of, is there something there or not? And my sonographers know that, and I'll show you that they know that in a minute, but here's his strain. His strain is totally normal, negative 18.2%. It looks fine. And again, our sonographers know that if we can't see that apex perfectly, or even if we can, we need to be giving contrast because I want to see that apex as clearly as possible. And I, I feel very comfortable after seeing this, that that apex is fine. But should I stop there or should I proceed forward? And if we look at the international recommendations for ECG interpretation in athletes, it's pretty clear that we should not be stopping with just an echocardiogram in this population, that an MRI with the diffuse T wave inversions becomes very important because you can't see what you, you, you can't see what you can't, you don't know what you can't see. And you may be able to see things here that are much different than you can get with an echocardiogram like LGE, like the apical variant HCM. So we did obtain a cardiac MRI in this patient. And you can see on the left that the measurements were totally normal as we got towards the apex. There is no evidence of apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that this all was beginning to look very, very reassuring from a phenotypic standpoint. Um, we use genetic testing a lot in our practice. So I did send genetic testing on him because of the ECG, which came back negative, which didn't necessarily help me, but it certainly didn't cinch a diagnosis. Um, the MRI was unremarkable, no enhancement, as I said. So we told him he was com completely low risk to continue his high volume and high intensities of exercise, but we weren't done, that he was going to have to continue to follow with us because this could bloom at any time, that his ECG being negative could still turn in, ECG being abnormal could still turn into something later on, despite phenotypically being negative at this point in time, and he was happy to do so. So it, as we think about that and, and think about this in the context of the paradigm shift, there have been lots of athletes who have been disqualified or who are under the impression that they can no longer play with these diagnoses. There, there's still the, the thought process out there. I've heard from some of my colleagues this phrase that the HCM is a death sentence, that once you have it, that's it. 
and you're done. Same with things like long QT syndrome. So the Martinez family got together along with other colleagues in the field and looked at some of these athletes. Um, and 72% of them, the majority being HCM, had been disqualified from sport and, and sat down. And then we did disease, they, they did disease specific risk stratification, shared decision making. In the majority of them, 91% of those athletes opted to return to play after all of that. 4%, interestingly, in shared decision-making, decided that they were done. They had the diagnosis. It was not a risk that they were willing to take on any longer, and they self-disqualified at that point in time. 5% of the athletes, despite wanting to continue to play and despite being cleared to do so by an expert opinion, uh, were told by their organization that it was not a liability that they were willing to take. And if you look at events at the end of the day, there, there was 3% um, of those athletes had events. Um, most were unrelated to exercise at all. So now, in addition to the risk stratification, we are pulling in the athletes in this paradigm shift, giving them a voice and giving them the opportunity to weigh in. And, and I can't emphasize the importance of shared decision making enough and how it plays a role in what we do from a sport participation. So how do we do this? What, what's the process which, with this takes place? So we, we talked about confirming the diagnostic accuracy, risk stratifying, but then we sit down with the athlete. We sit down with their support system. We, we have a full discussion about what it is that they have, educating them, make sure they know very well their diagnosis, trying to put together and determine what their preferences and values are, synthesize that information, we engage the stakeholder. So is that a college or a university? Is that a high school, a club team, a professional team? Wherever they come from, we are engaging them with the permission of the athlete. It's important to know who you work for, and I'll touch on that in a moment implementing that decision and then continuing longitudinal follow-up. So I, I cannot emphasize enough that this is not a one and done mentality that once you clear the athlete, check the box and all parties agree, you are not done at that point in time. The discussion should always be ongoing. And, and quite frankly, many of them are not happening in the office. There are constant phone calls, emails, text messages. This is a constant kind of go around to organize these discussions to make sure everybody is on board. People that participate in these discussions are parents, coaches, athletic trainers, administrators, agents, general managers, we are really running the gamut of those who have stake in sport to make sure that all hands are on board. It's multiple appointments. I, I don't think we typically have one shared decision making before making a file, final diagnosis. And in fact, I don't desire that. I like the athlete and their family and their support system to go away, think about it for a little bit and come back unless it's an urgent need to do so just to give them time to process what it is that we're doing and uh, come back maybe more educated than they were before. And again, this, the not one and done mentality also applies to risk stratification, that the risk of these conditions can change over time. That's why I showed you the phenotypically negative abnormal ECG before, that he's totally fine right now, but perhaps phenotypically he looks different in a year. That changes the risk stratification, that changes the calculus, and then that discussion needs to change at that point in time. So you need to come back to these diagnoses. And a really important point here for those of us who work with athletic organizations and teams that if a senior graduates college and moves on, if a professional athlete is traded to another team, that that athlete needs to be empowered with that information, that he or she needs to know that they have it and to take that with them to their next point. We, we cover the WTA, um, as you heard before. So with the WTA, we spend a lot of time engaging our athletes in what they have and what they don't have. They're all over the world traveling. We want them to be empowered by it. So it's really important that we are educating our athletes, our stakeholders along the way, not just making a decision of yes or no. I, I discussed this before. It's really important that when you do this, that you know who you work for. So it's very different for me if an athlete seeks me out on their own and wants to know what I think versus if one of the colleges or professional organizations I cover come to me and say, hey, there's somebody here. What do you think? Not that I'm necessarily going to change my calculus in terms of um, their risk one way or another, but it's just important that you know who you are working for, who you represent in the transaction to make sure that you are meeting their best decision, th their needs as best as possible. And it's important to disclose that to the athlete at that point in time, that if the athlete seeks you out on their own, hey, I work only for you. But if the athlete is sent to you by an organization, just so you know, I represent them, but we're still gonna go through this and, and assuage those concerns. Um, and again, we've talked about it. It's very important to give the athlete and their support system a voice to spend a lot of time listening as much as talking, maybe more so listening in order to synthesize all of their preferences. And it's not uncommon to see the athletes, um, you know, self-disqualify at the end of all of this, as I showed you with the study just before. And perhaps 
one other point that, that's extremely important here and maybe as important as anything else is discussing emergency action plans. Emergency action plans we have all heard a lot about, perhaps more than any of us anticipated after January of this year when DeMar Hamlin has his cardiac arrest. But emergency action plans are equally as important to all of this than anything. So first, what is an emergency action plan? It's an agreed upon set of steps and processes planned in advance to respond to any emergency situation. This can be in sport or out of sport. When it comes to sport, I really think it's best if collaborative, bringing all stakeholders on board to have that discussion. It needs to be rehearsed, edited, displayed, and distributed, and it's the ultimate insurance policy. And I, and I call it, it the keystone of athlete health and safety. Why? Because it's important for all athletes. Yes, we're talking about tonight patients with HCM who are then engaging in competitive sport. But if you look at the number one cause of sudden cardiac arrest in athletes, it's actually not HCM, which it was once thought to be. It's sudden or unexplained death. That means that their pre-participation screen was completely negative. Their ECG was normal, their echocardiogram was normal. And if an autopsy is done after an unfortunate death, that that's completely negative also. So no, no matter what, no matter who's playing on the field, it's really important to have these emergency action plans in place. And I think it's even more important in the contemporary era that maybe even now we should be developing athlete specific emergency action plans for any athlete that competes with uh, pathology relevant to cardiac arrest. And you may say to me, Eli, if you are putting these EAPs in place, but you've cleared the athlete, isn't that contraindicate? Doesn't don't those contraindicate one another? I would say no, that they're not mutually exclusive. That they actually go hand in hand with one another because of what I just said. Because the number one cause of sudden cardiac arrest in athletes is sudden and unexplained death. But if we are going to be putting these athletes who have pathology relevant to cardiac arrest into sport, then the least we can do is make sure that we have safety plans in place. That if that rare event does happen, that we're ready to respond in a timely timely fashion in a manner. And so this is a piece that we wrote for the ACC.org in terms of emergency action planning from a cardiac perspective. What's really important is to establish a written plan and distribute it to all the stakeholders. We really engage everybody in sudden cardiac arrest awareness and training. What does it look like? How does it show up in sport? How is it different than what you might see in a grocery store or an airport? We really emphasize the importance of annual CPR and AED training, not only for coaches and athletic trainers, but we engage administrators, the athletes themselves. We've trained a professional uh, soccer referee organization on how to recognize cardiac arrest and respond to it on a field. And it's really important to rehearse this and edit it and review it annually. And especially if athletes come into play who have cardiac disease that's relevant to sudden cardiac arrest, incorporate them into the plan. As I said, the importance of athlete specific EAPs. So with all that being said, you know, hopefully tonight you'll take back with you that exercise should be recommended for most patients with HCM. I do think risk stratification is important for all of those athletes or for everybody before they engage in the exercise, just so you can know what you know and uh, know what you don't know as well. But really, I think exercise needs to be part of the treatment plan for HCM. Uh, appropriate sport and position specific risk stratification is really important for the athlete or the highly active person prior to that return to activity. Um, forgotten people in in this group are tactical and occupational athletes. We have cases of those as well. Um, so we need to be thinking of them in addition. Shared decision-making is, uh, is now a part of the treatment plan. It's not just a luxury, but we should be doing it with everybody. And there's no question in my mind that emergency action plans are absolutely a must. They, they, are, they are not contraindicatory to, um, to, to getting athletes into sport. They, they are only beneficial for not only those with HCM or cardiac pathology in sport, but everyone. So with that, again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. These, these are subjects and topics that I'm extremely passionate about. I, I appreciate the opportunity to give you our view on this and, and some of my thoughts as well. Uh, and again, thank you to the Viz team.